And uh, the other thing, the only other thing I think, I think that was all I had to say this morning. So I'm going to hand over to Justine to um, start us off and I'll be monitoring the Q&A and as will the presenters. So um, we'll get straight to it. Thanks. Thanks, Vanessa. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today, wherever you may be. I personally am on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I pay my respects to any other elders who may be present here today. Uh, my name is Justine Hazelwood. I'm the Director and Keeper of Public Records at Public Record Office Victoria. I'd like to welcome you to the first Records Management Network event for 2021. Uh, this is the second one we've hosted online. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Before we get started on today's presentations, I'd like to talk about some of the current programs of work being undertaken at PROV. Work has continued to progress on various projects despite staff mostly working remotely. Uh, one of the major things that we're working on is a review of our legislation, the Public Records Act. Uh, we are working with the Department of Premier and Cabinet and the Public Records Advisory Council to consider some possible changes to the Public Records Act. Um, areas under consideration include the roles of the Keeper of Public Records and the Public Records Advisory Council, uh, the roles of the heads, the heads of public offices um, uh, and their responsibilities under the Act, um, the transfer of permanent records, um, the requirements for that, um, and also we're looking at penalties for breaches of the Act. It is expected that consultation with stakeholders will occur later this year, and the aim is for the bill to be in Cabinet by early 2022. Uh, in our transfer program, uh, we're still continuing with our digital, digital archive program. Um, so that is a program to update and improve our entire digital archiving environment. As a result of the work, we actually do have reduced capacity to take on new records transfer and uh, RDA development projects. So that's um, retention and disposal authority development projects. We hope to be able to return to our usual level of service in late 2020. However, due to the challenges presented by COVID-19 and the digital archive program taking longer than expected as a result of COVID-19, we now anticipate that we won't be able to take on new project work until late 2021. Our retention and disposal authority project response times have also been affected. However, we are continuing to work on high, high priority transfer projects. One of those is the program to transfer the departmental cabinet records on an annual basis. So cabinet in confidence records of the Andrews government's second term must be created, transferred and preserved as digital objects. And Pair of e is working with all of the departments um, to ensure that the records are captured in accordance with our VERS, that is our digital preservation requirements. Encouragingly, most of the departments have been able to package their digital records using existing commercial products that are compliant with our older VERS standard, VERS 2. The records of two departments have passed all validation testing and their production sets, as they're called, are now queued up ready for ingest into the new digital archive once it comes online later this year. We are working uh, with the third department to trial the creation of new digital objects in compliance with the new more flexible VERS 3 standard, uh, which is using code which we have developed in-house. We're also progressing our work with the Department of Premier and Cabinet to plan and manage the transfer of permanent records as required under the Inquiries Act uh, from the two Royal Commissions and the Judicial Inquiry, which concluded recently. These records are also pro predominantly digital. We've commenced engagement in collaboration with the Department of Premier and Cabinet with the new Royal Commission into the Concedo Operator and the Uruk Truth and Justice Commission, the first truth-telling body established in Australia. In terms of information management maturity assessment, um, many of you will have seen that our information maturity Information Management Maturity Assessment Program, it's a tongue twister, we call it IMAP, 
uh, report for 2019-20 is now available on our website. The report maps the state of information management across eight departments and two agencies within the Victorian Government. It is the third IMAT report to be issued and flags IM strengths and weaknesses as noted by participating organisations across the four dimensions of people, organisation, information life cycle and quality and business processes and systems. The full report is available for, for download from our website. However, some of the findings included that machinery of government changes, technological and system changes and the coronavirus pandemic have strongly impacted on prioritisation and resourcing available for IM activities this assessment cycle. That's probably no surprise to any of you here. As a result, the maturity levels this cycle were actually similar to and in some cases less than the levels achieved in the last assessment cycle. Uh, the information management framework and the Victorian protective data security framework continue to be leveraged for strong IM gov governance, strategic alignment and direction, executive level investment and top down engagement uh, led by multi divisional committees. Tools used as part of these frameworks, such as the information asset register, are proving to be central to progressing IM activities across organisations. Departments and agencies with a strong digital focus and investment appear to have transitioned to remote working more, sm more smoothly than others, partially due to business processes already being embedded within a digital environment. Uh, regular and ongoing review, analysis, reporting and management of identified gaps or risks as part of a dedicated and resource program of work are essential for improving IM maturity. In terms of our retention and disposal authorities, um, a reminder to keep an eye on our current RDA projects page. This page details what new RDAs have been issued and what our current RDA projects are. Uh, these are also listed in our Prof Bytes newsletter every two months. Um, if you're not signed up to get that, uh, it's very easy to do so through our website. This past financial year, we've also issued new RDAs for the magistrates and county courts the Victorian Managed Insurance Authority, the Victorian Government Reporting Service and Family Safety Victoria Central Information Sharing Scheme. A new RDA for complaint handling function is also coming soon uh, and it should be issued before the end of this month. Um, in terms of our service delivery, a reminder that we continue to adhere to the Chief Health Officers and Victorian Government COVID-19 requirements. This may mean that we need to close our reading rooms to agencies and to the public users at short notice. During circuit breaker restrictions, staff will not be on site to undertake normal records picking and career collection activities. Um, however, we, do, we are committed to ensuring that any records required urgently can be made available. As we need to make special staffing arrangements for this, we have to make those decisions on a case by case basis. So we ask that you only make order requests for records when they are absolutely essential. When an urgent order request is made, we will contact you to seek further details and just to discuss the collection arrangements. So we appreciate your understanding of these arrangements. I want to thank everyone who has provided feedback on the draft functional requirements for Microsoft 365 paper. If you are still wanting to provide feedback, please do so. We will, we will continue to incorporate feedback until the paper is finalised. Once the paper is completed and finalised, the paper will be published online and a link to the paper will be placed on Prof's website. Um, just to let you know about an upcoming event that you may be interested in. Um, the uh, Records and Information Management Professionals Association or RIMPA will be holding webinars on the 15th of July and 25th of August. Keep an eye out on the RIMPA website for details of those. We have limited time today, so let's get started. If you have any questions uh, for any of our speakers, please ask them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Each speaker will have time at the end of their presentation to answer them. Please note that the chat function is disabled so we can keep track of track questions as they come into the Q&A box only. 
So now to our first speaker. First up is Madeline Heather from the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing and the Department of Health. Madeline is the Senior Operations Advisor within the Records Management Unit Digitisation Office. Her role has been to lead and establish the Digitisation Office. In February 2020, the former DHHS launched its Digitisation Office. The service is now a key component of the shared service operation between the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing and the Department of Health, supporting those departments, entities within their portfolios and other agencies across the Victorian Government. The service is now well established following investment in hardware, service and process design and recruitment and training. The service has been a key element of DHHS's adjustment and reprioritisation throughout the COVID-19 response and associated periods of remote work by, uh, by providing staff with access to digitised hard copy records, mail, as well as printing and sending physical mail services. As well as providing these essential services, the Digitisation Office has strengthened the government's commitment to providing employment opportunities for people on the autism spectrum. The office is supported by the RISE program, which was established in 2017 to recruit people on the autism spectrum into records management roles. The Digitisation Office has the capacity to provide these services to additional agencies across the Victorian government. So welcome, Madeline. Hello, thank you so much. I can start my video now, sorry. <laughs> Hello, how are you all? Um, thank you for having me. Yes, um, we did set up the digitization office in response to COVID-19 last year. So I thought I would just give you an overview of basically how we did that. Um, we were met with a very quick requirement and response. We did have some, some scanners that were available at the time. Um, we were looking into this as a project that we might be able to complete at a later stage. Um, and then with the COVID-19 pandemic, we really had to test and adjust very quickly. Um, basically what we established was a process by which all of the items that come into the 50 Lonsdale Street address would be sorted into pigeonholes. Those pigeonholes would then be have a corresponding SharePoint location. Uh, so basically the items come into us, they're sorted, they're placed into a bag. Our team will prepare the mail. It will then be scanned and then it's automatically uploaded into a SharePoint location for the customers to access. Um, this did pose a lot of issues. We had some technical problems. Uh, we did have some system problems, um, but with good customer engagement, we were able to get this through quite quite quickly. Um, so within two weeks, we had the program up and running. Um, it has been an interesting journey, but we've managed to average about 550 mail items per day. Some days we get up to 1,200 items, especially during the the um, the stage four of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, because the deliveries were happening every second day, we'd have some days 100, some days 1200. So it's been a quite an amazing journey to be a part of. Now the team that deliver this is primarily the RISE program. So over 80% of our staff are a part of the RISE program. And each staff member has an incredible role to play. So we do have part people who do the scanning. This is high volume scanning that is quite technical, quite difficult to do. Um, and these staff members will basically get a big pile of, uh, of records, put them through a scanner. They'll do a quality assurance check on that as well, and then uh, export it out and send it off. As a part of this, all of the staff are also capturing data as they go through. So we do have tracking sheets and we have um, information that's being captured that will feed into our regular reporting structure that we do have at the moment as well. As a part of our good records keeping practices too, we do have um, steps at each um, at each area to make sure that we've got traceability of all of these records. So mail is a record and we are digitizing it. So we have to treat it as if it is a PROV record as well. So each item is scanned to uh, PROV standards for record keeping purposes. Each accession uh, is created to as a back end to the SharePoint location. So if there's a SharePoint site for payroll, there's also a trim accession for payroll. Now each box um, of items that comes through. So if I take you on a journey of a mail item, mail item comes through, it's scanned, um, and then 
it has now two copies. We've got the digital copy and we've got the physical copy. So the digital copy goes onto SharePoint. Most of the areas are downloading that from SharePoint and saving it in a compliant system. And then we've got the physical copy. Now, once we've got enough of the physical copies to put into a day box, that day box is then filed into a secure compactus area. Um, and that's how we keep traceability of items at all times. For each area as well that we've set up, it has a very unique naming convention. The naming convention allows us to have traceability of each item. So for example, if a business area was to contact us and say, we actually need this mail um, item in hard copy, they would just send us the link to the file that they've got in question and we'd be able to go and find it. Um, so that includes a barcode number, that includes the area and it includes the date, the scanning operator that did it, uh, the scanning op uh, station that it was done on and the timestamp down to the second of when it was completed. So we do have this wonderful um, process. We've had to evolve over time. Processes have been changing pretty much every month um, to accommodate different things. And it's a really wonderful place to be in now because we've got this uh, operation running quite smoothly. Um, so we are at a place where we can definitely scale up and we have been consulting with different areas and seeing if we can help different uh, government agencies with their digitization as well. As for the future of the RISE uh, program and, and where we see this all happening, we're in a place now where we've just procured an additional three scanning stations. So two book eye scanners that will allow us to scan more book and booklet type documents, um, an additional high volume scanner. Uh, these um, will provide us with the ability to scale up a lot more than we have been. Uh, and it's really quite exciting, but the issue that that does pose is that we don't have enough scanners to operate the amount of scanners that we have. So we're in a position where we can scale up. We are um, in a position as well where we're using the RISE framework um, to see if we can include and, uh, and hire more staff, train them and get them through the system. The RISE program has also had a lot of staff during the COVID-19 pandemic wonderfully go on to higher duties uh, on secondments as well. So the program is providing people with access to positions um, and secure positions that they've never had before. And we are finding that some staff specifically are just absolutely thriving and moving on, which is the absolute goal of the RISE program. It's to give them access to a VPS position and get them into a separate role, which is really wonderful. Now we don't just digitize mail, we do digitize records as well. We have recently done some records digitization in collaboration with the Department of Education. We have also done uh, a lot of different uh, smaller engagements for internal and external agencies. Um, of note, we do a lot of freedom of information digitization for our freedom of information team, um, which has worked out to be a really wonderful cost saving capacity because we do get uh, external agencies to digitize our records for us. Uh, so by reducing the amount that we're going to external agencies and by utilizing our services, not only are we saving money, um, but we're, we're opening up opportunities for us to, to also reduce the storage costs um, as well by in the future having items not being stored offsite. Um, so the future of the digitization office, we are very much pushing for a, a pr program where we can be really adjustable, really adaptable and really unique. Um, there's not many records that I don't think we would be able to digitize. And we have this wonderful team that is um, absolutely over 80% of the RISE uh, program. And being here is, is honestly one of the, the most biggest privileges. Um, it's so wonderful to have so many incredible staff be a part of this project. Um, so I can answer some questions. Um, is there any specific questions for me? I don't think so. How long do you retain the scanned hard copy record? Um, the scanned hard copy, so the scanned record is retained online. We don't have um, our retention times uh, completed at this stage. All of them at the moment are being retained full time. So we are in a place where we've got an improvement project where we're moving this forward. Uh, one of them would be to get each accession created so that we've got all of the retention times and that would allow us to, to work through how we are going to get to a point of destruction for that associated hard copy record as well. Uh, 
Um, I think that's all I can see is questions. Does anyone else have any questions for me or anything you'd like to me to clarify? Hi, Madeline. There are a couple more questions there for you. If you could pop into the Q and A, there's, I think there's two. Yep. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, how many staff are part of the rise team? So, I think that we have 16 staff on on board at the moment who are part of the rise team, um, and we do have another another series of staff that are um, on secondment in different areas as well. So once you're part of the RISE team, you always stay part of the RISE team, but the digitization office is not the RISE team. The RISE team supports the digitization office. So I think within these current roles, we do have about 16 staff, um, which is an incredible uh, volume of staff to have in the office as well. Um, each staff member, as you can see behind me, they're doing running around and um, doing what they have to do. And they've come in every single day during COVID. So it's been a really wonderful thing. Uh, we do rely on business units downloading the items into a compliance system. Um, Heather, that's, that is right. Um, that's why we don't have at this stage um, any plans for the near future to delete or destroy. We do have um, a backup of all digital records and we do have a, which is the exact same mirror image of the SharePoint site. Um, and all of the hard copies are on um, are on site as well. So they're all traceable at this stage. The next part of what we're going to work through is really getting this better down. So we do have a customer engagement project underway to check if people are, are uploading them into a compliance system. And we're gonna focus on those who aren't. A lot of the staff members, so for example, um, a minister's office will receive the mail and they'll upload it into um, our briefings, which is, is a compliance system or a semi, you know, along that line. So we're working through you know, where are they saving them? How can we ensure that we're following uh, record keeping compliance and how can we make sure that's happening? And that's really what the, the aim of the next stage of the project is, is to make this a very consistent and very um, concise project and make sure that we aren't skipping any steps. But we do have that backed up just to make sure, just in case, yeah. Um, Paula. What kind of provisions do we have? Um, we, we are very much a, um, it is a very easy to work in environment here. We have reasonable adjustments in place for most staff. So most staff as well, you'll see walking around with noise cancelling headphones on. Um, we do have the ability for staff to change the lighting. Um, so the lighting above us and things like that, we are able to change that. Um, if people need some space as well, we've been able to, I think luckily as staff aren't in the office, we've taken over a couple of private offices so that people can have their own spaces. We've also got things like quiet rooms and counsellors who come in twice a week um, to work with um, all of our staff, which has been a really wonderful addition that we've been able to add. We're also working um, in parallel to get uh, things like access to staff members with neurodiverse um, experience for Converge and things like that so that we can really start to streamline the way that, that the staff in the office have access to services that they would want to use. For the digitization, yeah, absolutely Heather. Um, I'd love to, I'm happy to share most of the stuff that we have in place at the moment. Oh, wonderful, Paul. I'm so, yeah, absolutely. And if you'd love to, if you'd like to reach out, I, I encourage people to. Um, we we actually at the moment have um, have had a wonderful staff member uh, come in. He's a student. He is in uh, year what is it year eleven. Um, so we're doing work experience for him, and it's you know the feedback that we've had is this is the first place that he's ever felt like he was a part of a team. Um, you know, a lot of these staff members have not you know, had many friends possibly in school and things like that. So it, it's a really wonderful place to be. I think um, anything that a staff member needs, we can do. There's nothing that I would say no to. We can look into anything. If it is an office space because they need quiet, we can look into that. See if we can steal one of um, one of the managers. <laughs> Is the service cost neutral? We're working towards that. We're working towards a, a cost recovery um, program at the moment. So we have built that in. We are providing quotes to different areas um, and making sure that our service is being charged at an adequate rate. We built all of the, uh, so the equipment and the software and the training, um, that all adds up, um, but that is built into our cost recovery process. 
Are, are there any plans for more neurodiverse hiring for other roles? Um, or where did that go? Sorry. Um, neurodiverse planning for other roles. Um, yes, um, the RISE program is not just limited to the digitization office and we're working closely with different areas. There's a possible pilot project going to go ahead with the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions um, to see if we can get somebody over there. Um, and to just see, basically we do have a, a way that we hire people um, through the RISE framework, which allows staff to not be hired through an interview process. Basically, the way that we have staff coming through is um, through a discovery day. So they'll come in for a half day and they'll try the role. Um, and then if they're happy and we're happy, then we'll move forward onto the next stage, with, which is an internship. Um, so there are two stages of the internship, internship one, which is two weeks, internship two. And at the end of that internship, if this is somebody that, you know, is doing well, that wants to be here, that, and, you know, everything fits for both parties, then we can go through with a VPS contract. And it's just removing that barrier of getting into the public service um, by having that face-to-face -face interview. Um, there are other roles that we will be advertising that are higher VPS levels, and those staff will then have to go through the regular process of interviewing, but they've also got the support around them in um, assisting with resume writing um, and coaching for interviews and things like that. So that's quite good. Um, we can also provide different ways for staff to do interviews as well. So um, by providing the questions um, up front might be an adjustment that we could make for somebody. Um, is that, sorry, I'm just trying to read through. I can't. Is it possible to have internship details? Please? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, Celia, Celia, if, if um, I if, if, if I can, <laughs> of course I can, I, I can send through the um, the RISE framework to you so that you can have a look through what we do. Um, and that really goes into the different ways that we can adjust for staff as well for their sensory requirements and for other things too. Um, so that, that will be absolutely possible. I'd be happy to share all of that information. Um, Andrew, how many pigeonholes or categories are there? I've got over 150 um, pigeonholes and categories at the moment. Um, this includes all of our regional offices as well. So um, we do, we have also created a, a um, pigeonhole called general. So often with mail, there'll be items that come into the digitization office that are um, either personally addressed and um, are a one-off item. So if it's a personally addressed item, we don't want to send that to a group of people. Um, it could be a contract, it could be something different. So um, they, those items go into general or items that we aren't sure where they go. Um, and then we have a staff member who um, will go through and she'll personally email those out to each individual person. And they're also held in their own uh, location. Um, so that's how we're managing those other types of ones. But for everything else, um, yeah, there's about 150 at this stage. Um, where it's likely going to change the way that we look with the split having happened between D DH, DFFH. Um, so some teams say the legal team uh, has now split into two. So that might be still one centralized location that they share, or that might be two separate locations. So that's a really great part of the customer engagement project that we're working through at the moment. Um, how did the service work during lockdown? Were you still going to the office? Um, yes, Christine, we were going into the office. So we were one of the only um, places in, in, I guess, in the state that were coming into the office every day. Um, so each staff member came in um, and we basically took over the entire floor. We've set up so that everybody's got their own unique spaces. Um, we've made it as COVID safe as we possibly can. Um, and each staff member came in and was able to provide that, which was really important. Uh, what software are we using for scanning? Uh, we use a we're using Kodak uh, high volume scanners um, and a, an associated flatbed scanner. Um, and the software that is associated with that is called Alaris Capture Pro. Um, so within that Alaris Capture Pro, basically we can create a, a job profile. The job profile indicates what the scanning uh, specs will be. So what the DPI, whether it's full color or grayscale or auto color, those types of things. And that's where we have all of the information on the job. So 
basically the staff will see um, a bag that they've got in front of them that's been prepared, might be called accounts payable. They'll go onto the scanner, click accounts payable and scan it through to them. So it's, it's all quite automated. Um, <clears throat> seeing if there's anything else that you'd like me to answer. I'm sorry, it's a bit hard to. It sounds like you were, no, I've gone through that. I think that's all. Is there any additional questions? Um, Vanessa, can you see or? Um, someone wants to know if they can reach you on LinkedIn to get more information. That's Sarah Bell. Um, and there is another question from an anonymous attendee about um, NIGO information that comes in across both local and international standards. Um, so, yes, uh, I do have LinkedIn, but I'm happy to provide the details um, of the digitization office. Um, after this meeting so I can send so you can come straight to the business unit so that we can share that with you um, that will be I think a lot more beneficial um, and how are we able to uh, we basically everything that we've done is in line with with the standards that are the public um, with the prov set out and within our own policies um, if there are items that come up that need to be addressed we'll address with them as soon as possible but we've not had that problem at this stage Just really pleased to see the RISE program still going. Oh, thanks, Sally. Yeah, it's a really wonderful initiative. Um, you know, you go home every day feeling really happy and proud. Um, it's a really wonderful, wonderful place. I think that's all. If you do have any more questions as well, um, as I said, I'm more than help, happy to share my email or um, share the contact for the Record Service Centre. Um, uh, the digitization office is a part of the records management unit so i'm more than happy to share that and we can um, have some more conversations at this stage we definitely are in a place to be able to assist with digitization services so if you are interested in digitization services whether that be inbound mail or uh, records um, yeah please reach out we are more than happy to and you know the aim of this whole process is to support the RISE program. Um, the more revenue that we have come in, the more staff that we can hire. Um, and that's our ultimate goal. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Pascal, regarding the Alaris Capture Pro cost and support, um, the costs are not too high. The costs are actually quite good. And the support, we've actually been able to engage with local business who have provided so much support. So um, even just via a phone call here and there, it's been amazing. But we also have included um, servicing um, and licensing uh, for three years. So there is that kind of level of support as well that we are contracted to. So they, they're, they're available to do that. There was one issue that did occur. Um, it was just a technical issue. And within two days we had Kodak. Uh, I think Kodak also was located in Shanghai at the time. So there was some incredible response times that were really wonderful to work with. Um, Sarah Bell, the, can the users select the areas where the mail is going? Yes. So basically the, um, when the mail comes in, it comes uh, to the scanner's desk and they'll select the job that the um, that's going to go to. So we have definitely um, had, you know, a here and there issue where somebody's clicked the wrong job. That's OK. We have access to the SharePoint. So it's a very quick remediation where we can just quickly move in and, and delete it and, and get it to go through again. Um, all of the issues that can come up probably have come up in the process of setting this up so quickly and we've been able to pivot and move very quickly um, and there's been you know few and far between issues that won't be able to be solved um, through minor process changes as well. Um, have you considered outsourcing scanning or digitization? So um, as a part of the general um, what we already generally have, um, we could definitely outsource. The aim of the digitization office is not to outsource though. The aim is to have all digitization for both departments to be done through this team. Um, we're still in a place where we can um, increase uh, the output that we can provide. Um, 
but it's also pending on budget and things like that as well. So the digitization office is here to stay. We've um, made that sure by procuring some additional scanners and things as well. So I'm hoping that when other people think about outsourcing, they think about outsourcing to us. <laughs> I think that's all of the questions for now. But yes, as I said, thank you very much. Um, it's been a wonderful project to, to establish and um, yeah, it's been a really wonderful place to work. Um, I couldn't be more thankful. Heather, did you get any funding that was related to the users? Um, I don't know if there was any fund. Uh, I do believe, sorry, that there is funding or there has been funding previously. I'm not sure whether there will be going forwards, um, but I'm not the one probably to answer what that looks like on the back end. I wasn't a part of that, but um, I'm sure that we can provide you with some more answers on, on what that looks like. Um, every area has their own box physical records. Yes. Um, so every basically pigeonhole um, upstairs has its own associated accession box, um, and that's where all of them are are stored in hard copy um, and that's exactly what the the digital record looks like as well so we very much tried to create a system where the they're working in parallel the parallel lanes once as soon as it's digitized and it moves across then we've got the exact same structures in place to manage the digital and physical records so that either of those can be located at any given time Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madeline. That was uh, fascinating. And I, I'm sure as I'm sure you are aware, because you got lots of good questions. Um, so thank you for, for presenting today. Um, we're going to move on now to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Vicky Harris from Maribyrnong City Council. Vicky is the coordinator information management at Maribyrnong. Uh, she has over 25 years experience in records and information management in law firms, in numerous state government departments and at PROV. Um, Vicky hails from the UK where she gained a law degree and has undertaken a master's in managing information technology at Melbourne University. Vicky joined Maribyrnong City Council in January 2020 and moved straight into COVID, um, which would have been exciting. Uh, Vicky's presentation is about the challenges, some of the challenges that she's faced over the last year. So welcome, Vicky. Thanks so much, Justine. Um, can you, can everyone hear me all right? Because my internet connection is not always the best, I'm afraid, but uh, that's good. Okay, a nod there, so that's fantastic. I'm going to sh actually share a screen with you and go through some slides um, that I presented. Just a minute. This one. Okay. Share that. All right. Um, now, would you mind, Vanessa, just telling me whether you can see that sh that screen, that share? Yeah, we can definitely see it. Thank. You. Oh, well, I can. If if people can't see it, pop it, pop your uh, comment in the Q and A. But yep. Alrighty, thanks so much. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Really pleased to be here to present a bit of information about what we're doing and how we face some of the COVID challenges. Madeline, your talk was really interesting as well um, in terms of your digitization setup that you've done. Um, just a minute. Okay, now Maribyrnong City Council, I know we've already, um, Justine's already provided some information about the Wirrawong and Gunnarong tribes. I usually start with paying my respects, but since that's already happened through Justine, I'll leave that. But I found it very interesting that we, the Kulin Nation has been here for 40,000 years, which is an incredible, I mean, that's just, beyond our imagination, really. Um, and Maribyrnong, which is the name of my uh, city council, it translates as, I can hear a ringtail possum. So possums are all around the place, obviously, and they're usually considered a huge pest, but the ringtail possum in particular is, um, it's, it's a lovely animal anyway. So I won't go on about that. So Maribyrnong City Council, we're about seven and a half kilometres west of Melbourne, if you don't know where we are. The town hall is in Footscray, 
and the Maribyrnong River is the boundary. You'll see that behind me in my, um, on my video screen. So we have a varied selections. When we do Zoom meetings, we can show parts of the actual um, Maribyrnong area. Uh, we've got about 90,000 residents. So I think it's useful to give a bit of background on this. So we're not one of the biggest councils by any, um, 900,000, sorry, by any um, stretch of the imagination. We've got about 680 staff and that includes part-time. We have four and a half IM staff here. So the vision for us, and it's a vision that would be shared by a lot of different councils. So it's very similar, I'll read through that, but um, I create strategic ob um, objectives are really a safe climate, healthy environment for people to live in. We serve the community and the community is there for us to serve. So very much about livable neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it used to be like there were three R's, I think, for councils, which was rates, rubbish and recreation. But we've now um, added very much um, the redevelopment side of things because there's huge growth, particularly in the area where I, where I work in Footscray. So a lot of new apartments being built, a lot of new areas along the Maribyrnong River that have been developed recently. And um, this is obviously a big part of what council are, in, are involved in. So I'm going to get now on to the challenges for COVID and records and information. And I've divided it into three. One was the physical, two is the digital, three is the personal. So I'm going to go through those each. So the physical, when we start, we have a team, we do the mail. So the mail comes in we actually um, process it into piles, which are in accordance with our particular departments that we have within council. And then we actually scan it and put it through a whole system. With the physical side of things, when COVID struck, it was really a matter of doing a bit of a risk analysis as because people would be traveling into work to do the work whether they'd continue to, to um, come in and do the physical mail or whether we'd look at outsourcing. So we looked at um, Australia Post and Grace and various areas that would do the mail processing for us. Against this was the fact that it was gonna take a bit of time to set this up with Australia Post because we had to change our PO box, etc. We also felt there might be errors in the scanning and with no knowledge of our system, the process would just be scanning it and then it would be sent to us. Also the slow network download because we do get um, fairly large plans and things that are sometimes put into our incoming physical mail. So the snail mail on the, on the side, we decided that we would continue with that. We would not outsource. And the main reason, though, was because two staff are willing very much to drive to work and process the mail. So that was the main thing. So we felt the risk of any COVID, um, catching any COVID, was very, very minimal. And obviously, inside the building, it was masks on and physical distancing. So with the record storage side, we were fortunate we'd already set up a scan on demands in place with Grace, who store a lot of our records. And that meant that any plans, et cetera, could be downloaded and we could um, pass them on to whoever had requested those particular uh, records from storage. Grace were continuing to operate in their normal way. So they were still bringing around also the boxes that we would need to request from, from Grace. Against it though, again, for scan on demand, it was slow network. So sometimes we just say, no, there's gonna to be too much in this. We're gonna to have to recall the actual record box. Um, again, there were occasional errors in the scanning, which we had to pick up and send back. So, and, but we did have a special dedicated PC to download this from the scan on demand. Dollar costs have really increased for us because of that. 
Um, and I think this is something where it's really useful to do a bit of a return on investment, is it worth us scanning everything that we're storing out in the uh, record storage, our APROS, Group at Public Record Office Storage Services. And I'd already done that, and I reckon there could be an ROI, including the sentencing for records, that would give us a return in about two years' time. But at the moment, this, this hasn't happened and hasn't gone through. But it's worth doing that exercise, seeing, well, what's out there, what's been out there so long, what hasn't been recovered for like over 10 years or whatever, and then looking at what important documents might be left and ensuring that the sentencing happens prior to deciding whether to um, actually destroy that record. Okay, the other project that we had was a paper-like project, and this was um, a couple of people coming to the office, and this was to go through our compactors, actually sentence all the records that were in there, and, and um, then we had the destruction process going through, so our CEO signed off, and we already had that authorization through from um, Justine and the Public Record Office, so that could go ahead. Um, there was concern because we felt there could have been some issues to do with COVID transfer if somebody happened to have um, been in touch with anyone, etc. But because there was minimal interaction with other staff, the staff members worked just within a, a compactus area. Um, and also the, it was high profile because it was on our audit register for the IT strategy and we needed to ensure that the, the work continued. So they continued working on site um, because there were physical files so we couldn't, um, we couldn't actually send them all off and process them elsewhere. It worked very well and the, I'm pleased to say that the Paperlight project has now closed for that particular area because we now have all the records in the compactus that have those that were sentenced, some were destroyed and some were sent off to growth. So that's all done. Now, on the digital side, it's really interesting hearing for you, Madeline, how you're setting things up in DHHS because we, in our mail processing area, we, we uh, I think it was about four or five years ago, no, it would have been longer than that now, actually six years, I think, that the, there was a digital system and integration set up. So we use EasyScan for our scanning of records, with the physical records, and then email records go into an inbox for us. We've combined that with authority that has a workflow that then goes through and we record things if needs be in our names and address register and then it's stored in CM9. We actually have to record any registrations, any infringements, notices, permit requests, applications, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things that are coming in and things that will be coming in by both email as well as physical. The physical side of things is diminishing very, very slowly, but only very slowly because so many residents do not want to use any online systems. They much prefer to do it in, uh, in a physical um, way and returning it. So these cover things like the fines, et cetera, we get, all those sort of infringements. And anyone who works in council would certainly know all of these. When I started working council, I was amazed at the different types of um, information that was coming through. And it really opened my eyes as to how much work is there. But that we were very, very fortunate because we already had that digital system in place. So the next bit of work, I'll talk a bit about this, was work that I did with um, Ia Shaw, Chris Gordon, who used to work at Prog. And we looked at um, digital signatures. Now, because everybody was out of the office and working from home, the majority, very much the majority of people, to actually sign the physical contracts, any internal improvements, any authorizations for leave, et cetera, et cetera, there was a 
uh, a big requirement to try and get some digital signatures working. Now we could have just picked up Adobe and used that, but it wasn't felt to be um, the best way of going. We did, unfortunately, we had um, another product that we did use for a, short, for a while using the digital signatures because we already had some working with um, Citrix and there was a free product on there which was used, but it's proved not to be um, so, I suppose, user friendly. So we're, we've, we've now looked at another product, but prior to that, um, it was finding out, well, what are people using these particular um, digital signatures for? So with Chris ran about 10, um, I think about eight workshops across the organization, mainly concentrating on the corporate area, but we also included building and planning the environment um, resource area and particularly maternal and child health areas because they're um, one of our key, key um, uh, digital asset areas that we deal with. So, um, and also some of the external ones, which would be considered a bit of a risk for us, which would be the life at the Mel um, Maribyrnong Aquatic Centre. They run a childcare centre. So there were quite a few groups that we got together, which is what asked them, well, what, what sort of contracts are you using? How are you doing? What are you using on the physical signature side? And then move forward to look at grouping those in a way that would make some sense. So from that, we actually then created um, very much with Chris's help, um, uh, some background information that was sent out to people, check through, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually we got a digital and electronic signature policy together. Very much willing to share that with anyone. Also got some help from the record management network um, from MAV and the um, council network that's on there. So put out a, a request, does anybody have one? And got a few responses, which was fantastic. So I think Peter from um, just down the road here, I'm just trying to think. Uh, the area he's in. But anyway, he gave me um, some information because they'd already done the same, set it up, got a policy. Um, he said it was very much rushed through um, in a draft basis, but really thought it was important to have this because people would be, um, there would be a security issue around some of the um, signing of documents. There would be privacy issues around storage of documents and also we felt it was one that if we had that in place it would give people then the confidence to do things that they could by say an email signature um, for example some of the lead forms that we have going through and there was an awful lot of different lead forms that the council seemed to um, actually use um, and also the um, the, just the necessity from a privacy and a security aspect. So we've now got that policy in place. It's just been approved by our executive management team, which was a bit of a process, but anyway, we've got that through and that's all been done. So we've got the tick there and we're, we're actually use, um, going to be using DocuSign for the product that we're implementing. Um, procedures on that are in place and we'll be moving forward to that. I know other councils have already used it and they've already got it set up, which is fantastic. And again, that's, that's helpful having that network where people can talk and find out what some of the issues are, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll be using that mainly for our, certainly our contracts, our um, agreements, any MOU type things that are in there any building um, approvals, et cetera, et cetera, that have to go through. And also we'll be um, setting up some um, forms and templates, which will be for internal approvals for leave, et cetera. Now, I know a lot of organizations would have already done this, but it's, it's a way forward for us because so much time is spent 
by actually um, having a hard copy, having to sign it, send it off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the whole process seems to be quite um, quite difficult, really. Now, when I did this and I set it up and we got the EMT TIG, I couldn't believe the number of directors that came and said, this is fantastic. We've been wanting this for such a long time and are, are really, really um, excited about it anyway. So that's one thing and it will help sort of people on the way forward, we hope. <laughs> Okay, just on a commerce uh, personal level, I actually commenced work end of Jan, COVID hit in March, had to do a whole home setup. Now finding a desk, was that an issue? Wow, I was a bit late off the mark, I think. Went round to office works, nothing there. Anyway, it had to end up assembling the desk. Um, so, and I know when I talked about this with my daughter, who's 24 years old, she said, why are you talking about this? This is so boring. So if it's boring, just switch off and um, I don't need to hear anymore. Um, then we moved house in June and the internet connection, that was another issue. So I'm sure other people would have had that particular issue um, with the internet not being good or dropping out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, yeah, just getting your home set up to enable you to work from home is, I think, um, perhaps underestimated in terms of the amount of effort people had to go through. Okay, I'm going to actually finish with, I probably finished a bit early, I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to finish with um, something that we have a Phoenix Community Centre in Maribyrnong, and it's where you, you go. And there was a competition which was for the um, uh, a photography competition. And I just love this. The winner of this was uh, Elijah Christiana and he called it perturbation. He was, he'd left school and he was starting uni. So he was very concerned about, you know, going to a new place, new people, new friends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was his illustration of the uncertainty and anxiety that can be associated with change during a pandemic. And I think, um, I think both personally and in the workplace, it really messed with your head because you had to sort of think on two levels. One was priority was safety of staff. How are we going to actually um, ensure the safety of our staff and safety of any public people coming through um, safety of all our suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but on a personal level, it was then, right, I've got to set this up, I've got to work from home. When people started working from home, I think they all said, oh, this is great, I'll just work in my pyjamas all day or whatever. Um, but then um, we seem to get onto Zoom pretty quickly and suddenly all these meetings pop up with Zoom and you feel, oh no, I'll have to get dressed. <laughs> but anyway, the, um, I like this picture very much and I like the description he gives at the bottom about the fluid like distortion of the face in the piece illustrates the dissolution of one's identity when faced with change, leaving them in a confused and raw state of existence. And I think because people have so many other things going in their lives that this was just um, it was it was a lovely picture, I think, and it actually would resonate, I'm sure, with a lot of people. So I'm actually going to finish here, I think. Yeah, so thanks for listening, comments, questions, and I need to get on to, sorry, I'll just have to go into Q&A. Um, one thing I'd like to say, I was going to put up a video on here, um, and it was about Trump, and it was a comedian doing this, but, and it was, we set up a WhatsApp situation with our team in, in work so we could communicate very easily, and um, a lass who works with me, who's a Chinese lass, she actually put up this video, but I thought it might be a bit insensitive because it's about Trump going on about Chinese, et cetera. So I, I haven't put it up, but
but it's um, it was very funny and we used humor a lot. Humor to look at, well, what's going around out, out, outside, inside, et cetera, et cetera. Last thing I'd like to say, I'm just upgrading on CM9 to CM9.4 and we're having quite a few issues. So if anybody wanted to contact me, please email me on the address I've given there um, because we're just finding that we've, um, we're have we experiencing quite a few problems. So it would be good if, to catch up with anyone else, particularly in councils that are having this particular issue. Anyway, uh, right, first question. Yep, we do, Sharon. We do use content managers workflow function to manage your contacts. Sorry. Oh, it's just gone. I don't know what that was, but anyway. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, Vicky, you'll just need to look in the answer. I, I, that was my fault. It'll be oh, it's all right. Yeah. It'll be all right. in the answer section. Okay. Done at the end? Yep. All right. Yeah, just go down the end. Um, we don't use the content manager function. What we do, we have a product called Authority, and Authority um, is a system that we've set up where it will help us with some workflow through, particularly for our names and address register, which is set up on another system. And it's very, very important, obviously, to keep that up to date, both for all the residents. Um, within council and ensuring that we can send out messages about rates, et cetera, et cetera, but also for all those um, fines, et cetera, that we'll give for parking infringements and also for all the businesses that we're working with over um, within the council. So we have that, but it, it, the workflow was set up mainly for us, mainly when we scan things using easy scan. So it has various areas where we can say, okay, it's that sort of record, scan the record, then we can go through and we can process it, reg one, register it, two, process it through, so it goes through to the right um, um, inbox, but we also ensure prior to that that it goes into CM9, our trim um, system. Um, so it's sort of, it's an automatic workflow. CM9 is the end sort of a repository for us and people can pick it up from there, obviously, but we're, we, we do it so it will go through both an email side of things as well as the um, um, into eventually into CM9. So that's all good. Okay, I'm very happy to share that copy of that policy. I don't know the best way to do that. Maybe Vanessa, you could... Um, you could let them know that. Um, yep, yep, can I please have the copy? Yep, me too. Yep, very happy to share that. What would be the best way, Vanessa, do you think to actually share that? I've um, kept, I've just noted down everyone who has um, requested it and yep. I will send you that list, Vicky, and you can... Um, okay, no, that's fine. Right. So I have got all of your names written down and if you do want it, and I don't have your name, you can actually email me if you like. You've all got yeah. my email address. Yeah, I know. I thought a few people might be interested in that. It's, um, yeah, it took quite a while to get together. In fact, it took probably over just over a year, ah, no, about seven months before it was approved for our executive management team. And part of that was due to COVID, but we're working through and, um, yeah, I'm working through with that, so it's good. Really happy if I could hear from anybody who is using DocuSign. Um, I have contacted a few other councils who are certainly using this, and whether they've experienced any difficulties, what sort of templates, etc., are being set up, the forms and all of that, because that's how we're dividing things up now, and we will be engaging with our end users to ensure things then process through, process through electronically, and it ends up both with the HR, if there's any higher duties form or whatever, and also would go into their personal farm, but also then go through to payroll. So we're doing a workflow process for that, which will ensure that that um, takes place. Yeah. 
Okay, what else? Sort of going through. So, yeah, copy the policy, no problem. That's all good. It's all good. I can't see any other ones. Is there anything else? That, there, are, um, there are a few more in the open questions, Vicky, if you have a look at those. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, digitally signature, great to see that. Do you want to catch up? No, no problem. Love to chow. Sounds good. Veronica, hey, Veronica. <laughs> um, oh, so glad. I'll be in touch. I will contact you about that <laughs> because, yeah, we've just had a few issues. Uh, why are you going to see instead of seeing 10? Mainly because we didn't want to. Um, that's Ian. Um, why are you going to CM 9.4 instead of CM 10? Well, the reason being, we thought that this wasn't um, really a major upgrade for us, but it actually has turned out into more of a major upgrade going to 9.4 rather than 10. Um, and yeah, we've just come across a few issues, mainly because we have a lot of uh, things sort of set up within CM 9, which just haven't don't seem to have come across. But anyway, I will get in touch with you, Veronica. Very much appreciate that. Um, yep, I can share that presentation if you want. That was copy also. Why are you going to be okay? Is anything else? Excellent. Thank you very much. Would love a copy of I thought you might like the policy, everyone. <laughs> That's all right. And you see, you can be shared, push all four issues. Okay, yep, there are a few, I must say. Um, okay, I'm just going down. I think I've probably answered, have I answered all of this? I think I have, haven't I, Vanessa? Yes, no? Um, I think you have. I'm just writing down everyone's, I'm just, getting a note of everyone's um, who wants yeah. to see, and I'll clear that out so um, Justine can move forward with the next presenter. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Prov, and I hope it wasn't too mundane, which I did say to Vanessa, it might have been a bit mean. But anyway, I'll shut up now and get off the line and pass over to the next person. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Vicky. Um, I don't know, Vanessa, if we can stop sharing Vicky's screen. Vicky can stop sharing her screen, but I can try and do it from here. Vicky, can you unshare your screen? Okay, I'll take away the power for her to do that. <laughs> um, Catherine, uh, if she wants to share her screen, I'm going to need to um, just go in and change that setting again. But we, I can do that. That's fine. All right. Uh, so we now move on to our next speaker. Um, and our next speaker is, uh, is Catherine Hall from, um, uh, from Deakin University. Uh, Catherine Hoare is the uh, university's information manager um, responsible for the university's records, archives and information governance. Catherine has extensive experience in records, libraries and information management across the public, um, private and not-for-profit sectors and has spent the last six years working in the higher education environment. Catherine's presentation will focus on record keeping through a time of major workplace change brought about by the COVID pandemic, which for the university sector has meant stripped budgets, large job losses and an uncertain future. Yet in this time of challenges, there have also been some key successes to celebrate. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Uh, I'm presuming everybody can hear me, but you'll out if you can't. And um, Vanessa, I will share my screen in a moment, if that's yep, all right. I've, I've made that possible for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm Catherine Hoare, University Information Manager at Deakin University. 
And I will be talking to you for the next little while about university record keeping in uncertain times. And when I say uncertain times, I'm not merely talking about 2020 when COVID hit and we all went into the year long lockdowns or so it seems, and all the chaos of then, and even the um, 2021 and right now where we're still dealing with the ongoing impacts of it but also the next two, three, four, five years and beyond, uh, because the university sector has been particularly hard hit and it's going to get worse before it gets better. We're not at the bottom of, of uh, the impacts of this yet. If we're lucky, it's estimated maybe in 2024, it might start to even out. And then sometime after that slowly start to get better. So, um, so this is a long change that we're facing in the university sector and that has impacts on record keeping so i'll share my screen let's see i think it's this one okay can yep we're everybody good. see that's so that's good okay so you've heard all my intro spiel so we'll Across. First, I'll give you a bit of context about Deakin and my team. So Deakin University, large and complex organisation. We have, this is pre-COVID, these figures, around 5,500 FTE staff, full-time equivalent staff. And considering universities are big hires of casual and part-time employees and flexible employees, there is, um, the headcount is generally much higher. Um, around 64,000 students at varying levels, undergrad, postgrad, research on um, coursework. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Catherine, but yes. I'm not, not seeing your screen. I'm just ah. seeing your I'm seeing your browser. Okay, let me just fly that back. There we go. It moved yes. the screens. <laughs> Dual monitor's not quite working out. Um, so Deakin University. So um, four physical campuses. That was uh, Burwood, um, Geelong Waterfront. And the little image I have there is the entry to the Geelong Waterfront campus. Geelong Warren Ponds, the original campus, and Warrnambool. And we also have one virtual campus, Cloud Deacon, because even prior to 2020, Deacon had a cohort of students who were entirely uh, online, who were entirely remote remote learning and Deakin has been at the forefront of distance education since it was established in the 70s. It's been one of the specialisations of Deakin. What, so the structures were already set up for the university to move almost entirely online last year along with everybody else. What last year did was it sped everything up and it broke down the boundaries between the on-campus students and the online students uh, and on-campus and online students. So I'll just so my team, Information Record Services, we're responsible for records management and information governance. We're responsible for historical records and our archives. And just to liven up what, uh, what is an otherwise fairly dull PowerPoint slide pack, um, I've put in some of the images from our archives there on, on each slide. They are not particularly related to the slides. I just thought they might be a little bit more uh, something visually interesting. And that's one of my favourite photos from our archives. And it's a couple of cows who got away and into the pond at the Warren Ponds campus back in the 70s. I, I think it was the 70s. Um, our university archivist would, um, would correct me. But um, so that would just liven up the slide deck a little bit. So we are responsible for archives. We have historical records going back to around the First World War, around 1914 or 1917. Um, we're a directorate of the library, so one of the four main directorates of the library, and I'm on the library executive, and my personal background crosses several information fields, so from libraries, records, archives, and, and corporate information management, started knowledge management in the 90s, like a few of us did back then, but um, so it's a good fit for us. Um, and IRS, that's the acronym we're known by, have seven staff in three capacities, so records, archives, and the systems underpinning both. So effectively, we're a small team. We have seven. We've got a large university of 5,500 plus, and we have responsibility for records management information governance right across that university. So we've always taken the, um, we've always had to take the approach and use strategies 
at scale to manage things on large volumes. So that's always been a matter of identifying the systems in which the records are held, identifying the processes around the university by which the um, records and information move so that we can hopefully insert ourselves into those processes. For example, um, procurement of new systems run out of our IT department, getting on board with those processes so that we can be consulted about you know, the records that might be held in any new system that's being that's being brought in and are they you know is the system um, fit for the record keeping of them do they can they be managed in place do we need to integrate with that system to pull them into the record keeping system at some point because they're higher risk or higher value um, even just identifying the key in people out in the organization who might be the ones responsible for that particular committee's minutes and agendas so that we can get them emailed to us or emailed into our record keeping system or that the student advisors, the sort of frontline student advisors, um, when they're emailing out information to students, they also CC in our record keeping system. So we've always had these approaches of trying to work in with the university's processes and business systems and trying to integrate as much as possible and do as much in the back end. And then 2020 hit. <laughs> so. Um, I first heard about COVID when most of you would have, which is January 2020, when you started hearing about this virus that's coming out of the Wuhan region in China. The Australian government closed the borders to China on the 1st of February. We were kind of expecting it a little bit at the end of January. So pretty much from the end of January onwards, the university went into crisis management mode. Because for those of you who aren't aware how university funding works, maybe 30 years ago, public universities were 70 or 80 percent publicly funded, funded by the government, and 20 or 30 percent was um, in, of funding came from elsewhere. That's entirely flipped on its head now. Um, and these days, 70 or 80 percent of funding, and these are broad brush statements that differs per uni, but around 70 or 80 percent of public university funding comes from other sources and only about 20 or 30 percent comes from the government. Most of the, the primary other source of full fee paying international students um, and the fees they pay um, subsidise every activity in the university, including the domestic student places. So the loss of international students hits universities financially very hard. So so from the uh, first border close, so in the end of January, Deakin went into crisis management mode because China is a major education export market for Australia, uh, for Australian higher education institutions. And for a good couple of months, we all focused very much on the delivering of teaching and learning to students who are stuck overseas. So Deakin students who couldn't get in, how are we going to deliver those services? A crisis incident management team was established for that. Um, and they were very much one of the first bodies that was created for, for 20, in, in 2020 to start making some significant decisions, getting some um, significant business actions happening. And then, of course, in March 2020, everything flipped overnight. I remember my boss at the time saying, sometime this week, the focus is going to change. And it did. Almost overnight, it turned from this external focus, how we're we servicing overseas students who, was, who can't get into the country, to how we're servicing them and all our student body who are already in the country and our staff and so forth because the country went into lockdown. So. so what does this mean for record keeping? Well, these new bodies, like the, the particular team that was set up in the crisis incident management area, um, we had a campus reactivation body that was set up later in the year. There was workforce approvals processes that were set up because there were hiring freezes and spending freezes. So everything was centralised. Every process in the uni was effectively centralised. And the authority to spend came back to literally the CFO. Um, so there were a lot of a lot of existing processes and bodies that were there were no longer used and we had some new, new ones. So major significant business decisions were being made very fast by new bodies with very senior people on them, as the VC and these execs. Um, new processes were created where these business decisions were happening and where business activities were decided upon and undertaken. And we weren't necessarily a part of those like we had been with the established ways of working. So we, and we weren't even aware necessarily that these bodies were being created. So 
that presented a real challenge to, to us um, last year. I wasn't even sure if what records were being created about the changes that were going, the university was going through, let alone where they were um, being stored and where the decisions were being made. And are we capturing the evidence of the business activity and the business decisions happening? Um, just by the by, that photo in that slide is the Warren Ponds campus in the 80s, an aerial view. So. so the big challenges. So that was one of the big challenges. Um, going into a major workplace change. So Deakin University lost about 400 staff last year. That's not counting the casuals and contractors whose contracts were not renewed. There were thousands more of those right across the sector. Um, and there was a loss of resourcing, so spending freeze, hiring freeze. Literally, you couldn't buy a box of pencils without going through a, a process that had central tick off authorization, and that was happening at the very highest levels. So, along with us not necessarily knowing where the major records were being, some of these records were being created and held at this point, we're also dealing with a staff, body of staff, all of Deacon staff who were very uncertain, who were afraid for their jobs. Um, record keeping was not the first thing on their mind. We lost positions. So we, we actually came off quite lightly. We lost a vacant position, but it happened to be a critical position we lost. It was the head of our records area within IRS because it was very newly vacant. And then the hiring freeze uh, kicked in. So we couldn't hire for it. And then the major workplace change wiped them all out. So, so we were working with, um, with minimal resources, projects that I put forward in December 2019, such as ways to further automate records capture and further and start to look at automating some classification so that we could get into some of the big platforms like all the SharePoint and email um, platforms that the university used that we didn't have as much touch point on that they'd like. And looked like they were going to go ahead December 2019. That was all stopped, all projects were stopped. And a lot of staff with staff leaving the organisation, not only did a lot of knowledge leave the organisation, but a lot of our contacts left the organisation. And I, I will always maintain that records is about relationships and we cannot do our job in IRS without building strong relationships and working hand in hand with Deacon staff. We have to be working with the teams and helping them because we can't go out there and eyeball every record that's been created. The volume is just far too far too high. So we need to work with the staff and not only in the staff body um, afraid and uncertain, not knowing about their jobs, but we're losing a lot of the people that we've built these relationships with. So that were probably the biggest challenges we had uh, last year. But there were some good opportunities. Um, I'll just check just just to uh, point out the image on that one, that's again the Warren Ponds campus with some students playing around in the late 70s, early 80s there. So, and the image on this one was the, um, I believe that's, that was John Landy, who was the governor, I believe, and it was at the um, inauguration of uh, our fifth chancellor. So new opportunity, some of the opportunities that came out of last year some of the ways that we found to approach the challenges actually opened up far more opportunities than I would have expected going in. Um, and it actually turned out to be quite a successful year for information and record services. There was a renewed focus on information management across the university because staff left in, in large numbers. The remaining staff had to think of new ways of doing things and they had to pick up the work that was left and figure out how to do it with less people. They were looking at this information that was left. Sometimes they were in roles where they were responsible now for sets of information. They had no idea anything about it. So they were able to contact us and we were able to work with them to help them through a lot of that process. Uh, the whole university was thinking about records and were thinking about information and records as a part of that um, across the board. So it enabled quite a few conversations that, um, that we could have. And it's those conversations that really start to open doors. And the flexible working practices of going, everybody living on Zoom, um, did mean we could get into some very busy calendars, uh, which a lot more easily than you actually can when everybody is working, has to get to a meeting room and find space, especially as we were already split over four campuses. So 
Deacon was already used to working at a distance from each other in many ways, and it just heightened that everything was just sped up and heightened. So we jumped on that and I think found some really excellent opportunities in it. So one of the things that we did, uh, one of the projects that we'd scoped out before COVID was to create a new, uh, create an information asset register for Deakin. We hadn't had one. Um, and I didn't want to just create a straight information asset register. We were going to do a full information audit right across the university. It was a large piece of work. And when we lost the position that would have headed up that work when COVID hit, and I was very tempted to say, no, we're going to end that project. We'll just postpone it and do it next year. Now is not the time. But one of the purposes of the project was to go out, IRS staff, to go out and talk to teams right across the university, face to face, or as it turned out, Zoom face to face, um, to discuss their information, their records on the ground. And last year turned out to be the perfect opportunity to do that. We were via Zoom, not in meeting rooms face to face, but via Zoom going out and talking to people right across the university in extensive detail about, about their information and where their records sat. And that was one of the benefits of last year was we could really do that project at a time when people were thinking about information and wondering how they're going to manage all this stuff that suddenly they were managing because their colleague who has left, left it behind. And it opened up a lot of a lot of conversations. So now we have, we've got over 600 lines at the moment on the, um, what we're calling the information asset register. Um, it's in fine detail and we're starting to go through and we're identifying some key risk points, you know, sets of records and information that we hadn't been aware of that are long-term and we really need to get a hold of, we really need to manage them effectively. Um, Whereas other places we recognise finding duplicates and, okay, we don't need to do so much in that space. So it's been a very beneficial thing. And as I said before, with records being relationships, and that's our key way into the business is those relationships. We've been able to build and make new relationships. And last slide, um, the image there is Warren Pond's campus, the original campus as it's been created. So... So 2021 and beyond, we're still in uncertain times. The major workplace change last year was phase one. Phase two is coming. We don't know what it will include. We don't know if it'll include more job losses. We don't know if it'll include restructuring. We don't know if it'll include something different. But it is coming. It will, will happen, phase two. So we still don't know what the future will be, except that it will get worse for the university sector before it gets better. But we are building on those relationships we have. We're trying to uh, strengthen the established ones and build new ones. And we're talking to staff and teams across the university in detail to build things like the, the asset register and do a, um, ensure we're able to get onto the processes and identify the systems where the major records are kept at Deakin and to integrate with those and be able to capture those records um, as appropriate without interrupting the business and the everyday working lives of the staff too much. So that's that's effectively my presentation. Um, just to let you know, one of our really successful projects last year was the History of Deacon website, which is where I pulled all those images from. So if you ever want to go see it, that's history.deacon.edu.au. Our archivist created all the content, wrote the entire content, and worked with the library's website teams to create the site from scratch. And it's a fabulous site, so go have a look. And uh, I'm happy to be contacted at any point. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Right. Um, and that's me, I think. So. Thanks, Catherine. Are there any, any questions or comments for Catherine? I wonder how you've, um, I guess one of the questions that I have, um, I have family at work in the university sector and how have you managed in terms of your team, like keeping them focused and um, I guess, you know, questions of morale and, and those sorts of, those sorts of things arise. So how, how have you managed, um, you know, in, in that environment? given how it's, uncertain everything is? It's been, um, it's been interesting, actually. Everybody has gone through low points. Um, 
because when you're not sure where jobs are going to come from and, and what's going to be lost, everybody gets nervous and worried. My team are already split across two campuses, so Burwood and Geelong. And we found during uh, COVID moving onto the Zoom and um, making a strong effort to remain connected. So we have a dial in every morning, five minutes, just purely audio dial in to say hello. We sort of shoot notes saying, bye, I'm off for the day at the end of the day and you know, weekly Zoom face-to-faces and things. So we made this concerted effort last year to remain connected. I believe that we're more connected now than we were prior to COVID. So we're, we're stronger as a team. We feel stronger as a team um, than we were before because we were split geographically before and that made it quite difficult so that there's been some really good benefits as a manager of a team um, coming out of last year we have spoken a lot and I try to keep my team as involved as possible in the conversations and just let them know as much as possible what I know about what's going on and also be um, as a manager I try and be understanding about people like if People are really worried. Let them worry, not you know, get too um, to cut them some slack is what I'm trying to say on that one. So it was a very difficult year, and people were seeing, even though our team only lost a vacant position, um, which might have gotten in the way of some of our work plans, but obviously wasn't. It was better in the in the human being sense because we didn't have to make anybody personally redundant people's friends were going around the university and they would be getting phone calls going, this person I've known for 30 years over in the other department has gone. So it, it was an upsetting time so for, for a lot of people. Um, just checking the Q&A. Um, I don't think there are any specific questions. There was a question about, um, which seems to have disappeared about your information asset register process. Yes, we, um, we began with just uh, a survey out. Basically, we identified, well, we identified who we wanted to contact first off and we sent the executives and heads of areas an email um, out saying this is happening. We got to actually my manager to send that out. So it came out at an executive level to say this is happening. This is why it's important. Can you please support your teams being involved? And then we, we contacted effectively the managers of teams across the board with um, an email with a spreadsheet, basically questions. Now we got some, we got quite a good response to that actually. I was expecting a low response, especially once the um, COVID hit. I thought well, they're gonna have other things on their minds. We actually had a, quite a decent response, but the main, the really valuable part came when we followed that up with phone calls and meetings. Um, and we started then to say, okay, well, we've missed this area. You know, who do we go talk to there? And we'd speak to people and say, you need to speak to so-and-so and we'd follow on those leads. And it was that personal connection of going and talking to people. Um, and it was a large body of work. So it was not, it was year long and we're still, and this is going to continue to be a large body of work. Um, but it's those relationships and the conversations that were the really key thing. Because people would put down what they thought was best. And I always said to everybody, this is a best guess from your end. And then my team will go through it and we'll come back to you and have a discussion. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and so we'd say, okay, well, this set of records or this set of information you say is on your network drive. It looks to us like it's potentially long-term information. Um, is it unique? Is it a duplicate? You know, can we have a chat about it in more detail? Um, and then we could start to work ways of capturing it if it was needed or understanding for this duplication so it wasn't quite as critical. Um, so yes. Uh, do you have any plans to apply any security access release features on them? And if so, can you explain how? The university has a basic class security classification scheme of four levels um, from you know, completely open through to, you know, um, highly confidential. Um, we are, one of the questions we asked was, is this private information or, you know, is it sensitive information so that we could track where our sensitive information sets were across the university. Um, so we can track by security level. We can track by the sensitivity level. Um, we do have a cybersecurity part of the university and I work with them quite closely. 
and I also work with the privacy team quite closely. So we're all sort of talking about now how to use this data um, in more detail, because a lot of it. Um, from the conversations with stakeholders, what is coming up and how can your team help them go through and manage their records? So there's a lot of things coming up. So for example, I was having a talk to one team who um, would uh, who respond to complaints from students and um, on campus, and it's often to do with student welfare. And there's the potential that these might be minors because it's undergraduate students potentially. So it could be under 18. And they could be complaints about some sort of assault or something like that on campus. We don't know specifically, but um, there's that potential, which makes them long-term 99 year plus type you know, highly sensitive, possibly highly sensitive records. So we've got to manage them with that highest level of, 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 um, of concern. Now they were sitting in a database at the university where, which had been checked for privacy concerns, but it's certainly not a long-term preservation system. So at the moment we're working through, okay, well at the moment we know they're safe and they're kept private, but it's not a long-term system and it's not, an, it's not, really a compliant record keeping system. So what is the best process now to deal with this set of records? And we, but now we know they exist. I didn't know they existed before. So as I said, it's a large complex organization with a lot of records. And I am talking about um, the records are almost, we have some physical records, but we're talking about mostly digital records. Um, so we do have a large physical repository um, at Deakin and we do get some physical records through, particularly research and, and you know, surveys and things like that that are physical. Um, but the bulk of records have really been created and kept digitally. And so it's identifying those things. Um, then other things would be, we identified a system that was um, managing the animals that were kept for research purposes. And you know, what's the retention around that, um, which was a much shorter retention. So. So we determined then we determined that system can manage it fairly much in place. So, so they were the sorts of conversations that we were having. Um, let's see. How do you intend to use your information asset register going forward? In many ways, I use it for strategic purposes. For me, I want to be able to know where what all the major risks are, records and information risks, and how to prioritize them and what we do about them. Um, it might be that some are really big and we not, don't have the funding right now, but at least I can let the university know, well, this is a risk and we need to actually understand that and we need to think about how we manage that. Um, and I'm not sure, oh, there was a, our prof's dealing with the um, audio issue. Um, so that's how I personally will use it as the head of the information records area um, and to go out and make those relationships with the university. The privacy team will be able to track all the sets of private and sensitive information around the university. So we'll be able to go, here is our set of in sensitive information. Cyber security team will be, able to, will be able to talk to them and work through where some of the risks are. We really want to start looking at some of the information flows now and um, the information that shifts between systems and is duplicate across systems because it's there's a lot of systems at Deakin and a lot of the small ones and big ones and information moves across them and we don't really have a good handle on that at this point so that's one of the um, one of the, the things we'll look at going forward so um, any other questions I'll hand it back over. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and that conclu concludes the presentations for today. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers for presenting today. Um, we had some very interesting, um, I guess, observations of the year just gone and the way that it's affected um, people who are on the ground looking after our records. Um, and I think you'll, I think from judging from the questions that we got, um, all of you also found it very interesting. Um, I'd like to thank again, thank everyone for coming, thank our speakers for presenting and look forward to seeing all of you at a future Records Management Network event um, sometime in the next six months or so. So thank you everyone.
Thanks, Justine. I'll just remind everybody that I will follow up on um, all those people that asked for resources. I'll get onto the speakers about that. So rest assured, I'll be onto it. If you don't hear from me by, oh, sorry, uh, if you don't get something from the speakers in the next few days, because I'll email them today, um, 